So the next talk in the state of the art session is remote sensing and spectral geology from Dave Coulter. Uh, Dave has a PhD from the Colorado School of Mines. He's worked in mineral exploration for over 30 years, he worked for Newmont Mining, and is now an independent consultant in remote sensing. And he tells me that most of you already know him. Thank you Dave Coulter. <clears throat> I don't know if my speaker's on. Well, I can, I can project to a crowd this size without the, uh, the AV equipment. Um, thank you. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here back in Toronto. Um, my first um, uh, DMEC uh, conference was 1987, so all of us are aging. Um, and it's a particular pleasure to be in Toronto on a warm and balmy October day instead of a frigid day in March when I'm usually here for uh, PDAC. Um, I want to acknowledge my co-authors. Um, the fact that it takes four people to write a paper on remote sensing um, says a lot about how remote sensing, in particular spectral geology, has progressed. Um, we are diversifying and specializing in particular areas of the field. Um, so I'm going to start out with why it's spectral geology and remote sensing instead of remote sensing or remote sensing and spectral geology. So I'll give a bit of a historical perspective. The first revolution in remote sensing was the transition from photography to multispectral digital imaging. That occurred in the 70s and 80s. Um, the exploration implication is we no longer were doing just photo geology, making kind of very analog manual interpretations but we were doing truly geologic remote sensing. The second revolution was where we went from spectral, from multispectral imagery to spectroscopy, and that occurred starting in the 90s and progresses to this day. Um, that is where, in the old days of thematic mapper, we produced for the field geologist an anomaly map. This might be alteration, but it could be wet soil, it could be a, mul a multitude of things. And as we started moving to a spectroscopic approach, we went from these ambiguous anomaly maps to making a statement about alteration and mineralogy. The third revolution, which we are in the middle of right now, that's the dimensional revolution. That's where we went from simply mapping the surface to mapping in 3D, mapping core, logging core, which has gone on for some time. Um, we, we have been doing that for many years with spot measurements, now we're doing full range measurements, full imaging measurements. So now we're looking at the full three-dimensional picture. So I always like to start with conclusions, and you'll, these will come back. Um, this is a fundamental truth. Geophysicists may not like it. Fundamental truth is mapping and core logging are how deposits are discovered and defined. That is unequivocal, and it's probably not going to change unless somebody comes up with a way to identify gold or copper subsurface with some kind of Star Trek type device, which is not likely to happen. So this is a simple reality. We claim, or we know, that what we do with spectral geology and remote sensing provides mapping assistance. It provides um, identification of alteration minerals that are invisible to the human eye. And this is particularly true of fine grain alteration minerals, the white mush that occurs in many, many core samples, field samples. The other thing that I argue, and I know this from reality in the field and working on a lot of things, there's cryptic alteration pa patterns. There's cryptic ore deposits out there. They're not obvious to visual examination. They've been walked over. Every geologist has a story of how they sat and had lunch on what turned out 10 years later to be a discovery outcrop, because they couldn't see it with their eyes. And so when you look at these things in the light of modern concepts of ore deposits, modern concepts of paragenesis, um, we know that not all exposed ore deposits have been discovered. They're sitting out there waiting to be discovered. The methods I'm going to describe um, permit extremely high sampling densities and selectable sampling densities. So you can choose the, the resolution that you want to sample and the scale you want to sample. Um, and finally, I mean, this came up yesterday in, the, in a panel discussion. We're not talking about replacing geologists, we're talking about augmenting geologists. This is 
methodologies, technologies that augment human thought. They free the geologist from the mundane stuff. What mineral is it? Squinting through, through that hand lens and trying to figure out a crystal habit to identifying the minerals in a semi-automatic way and allowing the geologist creative thoughts to find an ore deposit. That's the key thing here. We're not replacing, we're augmenting. It's a common term that's used throughout IBM for their Watson and for their AI and for their machine learning. It's human augmentation. So here's a technical agenda getting into the real stuff. Um, I'll talk a bit about the basic theory, and then we're gonna I'm gonna focus on three things, satellite imagery and the advances in satellite imagery, airborne hyperspectral um, imagery and that, how that's evolved, and then the revolution, which is the core imaging, and the three-dimensional, not only for exploration, but for exploitation, life of mine data. So we use, in mineral exploration, we focus on optical remote sensing, runs from these ranges of, uh, of wavelengths. Um, we like to focus on that, it's simple, and it also involves conventional optical um, components, lenses, mirrors, photon detectors. It, this also covers wavelengths that map a lot of our critical alteration minerals. We sub a physicist can do it, do it different ways. In our world, we subdivide this into what we call the Wiener, the SWIR, and the TIR, or the LWIR, the visible near-infrared, the short-wave infrared, and the thermal infrared. So this is where our world exists, between the red bars that part of the electromagnetic spectrum. That's the optical range of the electromagnetic spectrum. And I explode the, the visible light here just to point out that little tiny slot is what a human being sees with their eyes. This broad red slot is what we see with our techniques. So we increase the range of detection by two to three orders of magnitude which is the important thing to think. We're seeing the invisible. This chart, which is an eye chart, it's in the paper, it'll be here. This, this was produced by TerraCore, and it's a really nice, slick way to see what is detectable, what isn't detectable in the range of remote sensing. The key thing to notice, if you follow all the red bars down, the only thing that we really, that we really fail at are the, the the metallic element, or the metallic minerals, that's um, mainly because they have a spectral reflection. You don't actually get a response. The light hits it and bounces off in another direction. So they can't be diagnostically detected. This just shows some of the spectral fingerprints. This is what our world is about. Minerals have diagnostic spectral fingerprints. We are utilizing technology to look at those fingerprints. So let's start out with the first technology advance. This is advances in satellite imagery. Um, we kind of chose two that were really key. The first one is improved higher spatial resolution in the SWIR, the range on the, on the left, which is where we have a lot of clay-like, sulfate-like sulfate materials that are really critical for, for exploration. And that's done in the shortwave infrared. So, we're gonna look at how we can identify those. As um, Soon as we start looking through the atmosphere, we have to deal with the atmosphere. This is a transmission curve, shows the atmospheric windows, the high points, the atmospheric um, opacities, the low points. We can only use, utilize those windows. This shows just a, an example of the Aster satellite, and you can see how when they design a satellite, they pick bands that fall within these atmospheric windows. SWIR is really critical. This is where we map all of our mushy white rocks that we don't know what the mineralogy is, we don't see crystal habit. Since 2000, Aster has been our primary tool. It has these resolutions, as you can see, fairly coarse. Um, but we can, with Aster-type satellite imagery, we can map general mineral families. It's no longer an alteration anomaly. These are mineral families. Previously, TM only allowed us to say it's a possible alteration anomaly. A key aspect of this is scale, and scale is critical for identifying ore deposits. At 30 meter resolution in the shortwave infrared, Aster is giving you about one to 60,000 scale. There's a little rule of thumb there that's nice to put in the back of your head. 
the scale is equal to one to the pixel size in meters times 2,000. Um, I don't know if John Gingrich is here, but he gave me a good bit of advice um, a number of years ago that discoveries are typically made when you're mapping at one to 5,000 scale or more detailed. So that's a good number to keep in your head. The key issues here are in 2014, Digital Globe launched a satellite called Worldview 3, which provide aster-like mapping capabilities only at much higher spatial resolution. This, um, this, this graph, which has got a lot of information on it, the main thing is to look at the comparison between Aster, where you can map mineral families, Worldview 3, which has similar band passes. Um, currently, commercially, the regular man on the street can get seven and a half meter resolution. That's one to 15,000 scale. Um, it measures the data at 3.7 meter resolution, but due to um, US government um, concerns over letting us common people use SWIR data, they, uh, they degrade the data. That may or may not continue to be a, an issue in the future. This just shows what happens when you go from 30 meters to 7.5, 3.7 meters. This is um, in the Battle Mountain District, a, a small area of philic alteration. In Aster, that was the response you would get. Would you go to the field and look at it? Some people would, most people probably wouldn't. But when you start getting down to 7.5 or 3.7, 3.75 meter resolution, that starts resolving itself into a spatially coherent alteration package. That's a small package of philic alteration that if you saw that in an image, you would follow up on it. If you saw this, you would probably not even bother spending the time going to the field. Just to point out, Aster is still a good choice for regional mapping. Um, in just last year, um, all of the data, all of the Aster data globally became available free of charge for downloading. It's also precision orthocorrected, which is always a problem with Aster. It looks side to side and you get topographic effects. Um, the US government is now providing it all orthocorrected. So that provides opportunities now, instead of focusing on a small area, picking up a bunch of images and, um, and perhaps doing data mining and do large scale studies. So the bottom line is Aster's not going anywhere in the near term. The data's out there from 2000 to 2006-ish the data are good quality, and most of the world is covered. So the other kind of big change in satellite imagery is, is, is called agility. Um, when you look at satellite agility, the Landsat series and a lot of satellites, they just look directly under the ground, wherever they're flying. What's underneath them is what you measure. With Aster and Spot, they started saying, okay, we want to look side to side so we can get a little bit more coverage. And the latest satellites have three degrees of freedom. This is Pleiades um, concept. It, ha it can look in any direction. The critical thing here is one aspect is the ability to rapidly task the satellite. They use gyro, inertial gyro controls to be able to quickly move it without having to have, uh, have propellants on board. Um, you can dodge clouds, you can pick areas where if you have an area of interest where there's no cloud, you grab an image. Um, you can have a whole bunch of small like prospects and you can say, oh, I want this, 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 and this, and you can task them in or multiple companies can task an area and in one orbit they can grab a whole bunch of things. Probably the more critical one, this is a typical problem in the Arctic, you want a large area covered. If you had to wait for every time the satellite passed, it might take you two or three years in the Arctic where you only have six weeks maybe of acquisition window. It might take two or three years to cover a large area. Now the satellite can, can look back and forth and effectively scan a large area. So that's really going to be critical in the future, particularly in northern latitudes. So we'll move on to hyperspectral. This is my area of expertise. Um, the advances there, one is faster processing. That's mainly because of, of um, solid state drives. And I'll show you what, a, what data looks like from, uh, in three dimensions from these, from these measurements. Um, the other critical aspect has been a significant improvement in geolocation of flight lines and be able to, to ortho-rectify the data, which has contributed to an increasing number of large comprehensive surveys. This is an improvement, the last one, wide swath, SWIR hyperspectral, has been an improvement that's just come on in probably the last 18 months, and you'll see the, uh, the improvements of, of efficiencies and costs for that. 
So hyperspectral, we have an instrument that goes long. It's got a 2D array. It's looking across the flight line, collecting one line at a time, dispersing the wavelength in the other dimension. Creates this data cube. Anybody that does computer processing knows if you, if you cross uh, physical records in a spinning drive, it's horrendously expensive in time. So the SSDs allow us to traverse this cube in any direction, in any dimension, um, without any penalty. Um, we're back to the atmospheric window. In general, in mineral exploration, we look at two ranges. We look at the SWIR window, and we look at the visible near IR window. This window is really critical for petroleum exploration because there's actually some hydrocarbon absorptions in here. But in this range, the, the rocks are generally pretty flat. It doesn't really provide us any real information, signal information. This just shows an example of what we can do. This is a project in Morocco, um, and I'll show you the map of the area covered. But we're doing ot crop scale mapping. And this is a nice little alteration package. The blue is porophyllite, um, and it's a, it's a epithermal looking system. Certainly from a Nevada perspective, you would say it's epithermal ribs and knobs and all that. But we were mapping these specific outcrops. This just goes to the large survey concept. Really started with the USGS. In, uh, in a wild, crazy mood, they decided they were going to fly all of Afghanistan at about 20 meters resolution. And I don't think anybody has taken on a project like that, had taken on a project like that before. Um, so this is like a huge survey, spatially. This survey is actually about the same volume of data. This was the uh, ONAM, the, uh, the, um, the natural resource organization within the, the, the Kingdom of Morocco. And they contracted a very, very large um, survey covering only about 12,000 square kilometers, but at much higher resolution. But you can see the huge number of flight lines. Every pixel has to be orientated, spatially orientated correctly. So precision geolocation is key. And to process the volume of data, SSD te technology allows us to do it very rapidly. The wide swath SWIR. The SWIR has been limited by available, commercially available technology to about 384 pixels across track. Recently, um, the government, I think largely, because I think they've had these for some time, has allowed release of 1,024 pixel swath width. So these two cameras, the iTRES SASE 1000A and the Phoenix 1K, um, exploit that technology. This just gives you an idea of the, the, the improvement of going to wider swath widths. This is same surveys, 2,300 square kilometers. And the, the bottom line is the key thing, because that's the cost driver. This survey with the 384, 320 usable pixels would take you 41.3 out, over 40 hours flight time. It's probably 15 operational days to get that survey collected. And when you go to the 1K, you're looking at under 10 hours, so probably three days of flying to collect the same area with the wider swath width. And this is the one everybody wants to see. Um, Spectier was kind enough to actually release this information. The floor for costs with the older arrays was just under $300 a square kilometer, assuming a two meter pixel on the ground. When you go to the wider swath width, the floor comes down to about 100. So you're looking at a three times improvement in the, in the, in the cost. So now I move to the revolution, hyperspectral core imaging. Um, we're doing here full core hyperspectral imaging and full range, including the long wave infra infrared, which we generally don't do from the air. Um, we can, but it's not often done. Um, automation and real-time analytics provide immediate answers if you are willing to pay the price. I mean, you can do it to a bureau service. If you want immediate answers, you can do that. You can be looking at your core in almost real time. Um, Using um, modern um, semi-quantitative mineralogy, and um, uh, one of my co-authors, Zhao Deng, shows this in a paper that she's going to present later, that showed up as a three times improvement in efficiency of core logging. Um, here's one of the really critical things. These data are not just for exploration. They are life of mind data that can be used for a whole variety of things. We'll see an example of that, giving general costs, low-end bureau service, ship your core, get results back, 
maybe in the $10, meter, $10, $10 per meter range, if you want real-time, on-site, interactive, where you're getting instant answers and deciding where you're putting your next drill hole, it can go up to about 50. These are the two primary providers. CoreScan and TerraCore shows their, their equipment. And <clears throat> I'm going to show three examples of how you use this data. First one is the simplest one, the digital core box. You're logging core, and now you have an underlying base mineralogy when you are logging core. You're no longer using just your eyes. You're using analytics that already are presenting with, to you the mineralogical answer. Um, so that's, just a, that's, that's the simplest approach, showing using various ranges of different mineralogy mapping. You also, you know, you may not have perfect analytics. You might be 90, 80 or 90 percent right on each pixel what mineral it is. But when you, when you summarize those over intervals, it becomes highly accurate just by, the, by statistical laws. You, you, you have 80 percent accuracy, but you have 220,000 pixels in a meter and you summarize them over the interval. Then you start getting percentage logs, mineral percentage logs, and you can see distinct breaks. This is a, this is a SCARN deposit using a long wave infrared, and you can see these distinct breaks going from the exoscarn. This break is a significant one from an exoscarn into an endoscarn, just looking at just a raw color map of looking at the, at looking at the mineralogy. For exploration, this, this really summarizes very nicely of how using these logs of, of the various um, alteration mineralogy, you can start putting together a three-dimensional picture of the paragenesis of the, of the alteration in an ore deposit. This shows the gold. This shows the, the, um, the, the, the alteration log. Um, Zhao Deng will give a more detailed talk on this later in, um, in the week. This is where the really critical part comes in. So this is an example of using mineralogical logging and taking that and making it a proxy for grindability of material. So you basically can do a regression to that mineralogy. This is the 3D grindability hardness map, if you will. This is the geologic, um, geologic block model, and this is the proxy generated hardness of material the blues and greens being harder, the reds and yellows being softer. So, as was pointed out in a workshop yesterday, um, you know, this little blob right here, is that ore or isn't it ore? It's incredibly hard. So, with the geometallurgists get this and the, and, the, and, the, and the mining people get this, they may decide that's really not ore because it might break all the jaws in the crusher. So, you might want to just take that, even though it's got good grade, that might have to go on the dump because it could break your, break your crusher down and shut down the mine for two weeks while you fix things. So this is an incredibly important aspect of what we can do in the life of mine cycle with these data. So exploration data collected for exploration has to be viewed in, these, in this, this hyperspectral core logging as something that contributes to the life of mine. So there has to be that interaction now between the mining engineers, the geometallurgists, the geologists, it's no longer, oh, we just go out and find mines. We find mines and we provide you with data that will help you mine your deposit more effectively. So that's where we are. Let's look at few, talk about future trends. I start with what I just ended with, full integration of hyperspectral core logging into life of mine cycle. That's a cultural tr transition that has to be made. That has to be made from the executive level down to say, we want you guys, geologists, talking to the exploration people, talking to the mining people, and making sure that we're using those data effectively. Satellite hyperspectral is a lost child. It's been talked about for ages. Um, every time I give a presentation like this, this number changes. The last time I gave this pre presentation, it said 2015. Question mark. Now it says 2019 question mark. This is a 30 meter um, hyperspectral um, satellite that's being um, launched by the, the Germans and should be coming online. Um, the commercial side, we know we can do five meter. It's been proven by the military and released. The information has been released as possible. Um, that's still in the um, funding and planning stage. Long wave IR from airborne, it's, it's definitely doable. Um, there's three instruments out there. 
but it currently lacks broad acceptance in the exploration industry. It's not that we can't do it, it's just people aren't accustomed to it, so that's where we need to educate people. I'll, I'll talk about this just for a second. Drone-based hyperspectral, I always get asked about that. Well, we'll do this from a drone, we can do it from a drone. We have basic fundamental challenges. When you put together an instrument and a, and a precision GPS INS, which is essential, your weight, your power requirements, and um, the fact that we usually are looking for things at pretty high altitude make small, medium drones really difficult. This is a data that came from the government. Drone crashes are 100 times more likely than piloted aircraft crashes. That's, those are statistical facts. That is a statistical fact. Pilots are highly motivated to get on the ground alive with your half million dollar package <laughs> included. Um, just the final comments just goes back to the beginning, just repeating what I said at the beginning, and I hope I've proven these, but I highlight this. We augment human capabilities. We don't replace human capabilities. That's the most key thing to remember. These tools augment human capabilities. And we'll put up all the acknowledgments. A whole lot of people gave permission for the publication, for the data, and we would like to, um, to thank them for their, for their contribution. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks. thanks, Dave. We'd have time for maybe one uh, question, if there is one. You could step to the microphone. Hi there. Um, thank you very much for that talk. That was great. I'm just wondering, do you think that when you're analyzing this kind of data that's on the really, really small scale, you have a problem integrating it with a lot of other data sets, say in multivariate space, where you're looking at a, a larger scale, like more the, the one meter whole rock assay, uh, or, um, yeah, multi Yeah, I think, I think at the end of the day, you know, you have, the, you have your digital core box, which is your visualization, which is important to have for, for core logging. At the end of the day, when you're really using the data, you're going to take those 220,000 pixels over one meter, and you're gonna summarize them into an interval. I don't think anybody's taking all of the data and putting it into a LeapFrog or into a GoCAD. It just, it would overwhelm those systems. The reality is you're gonna take it and you're gonna match whatever your intervals are, whether they're small from twos for say a vein where you, where you break up your from twos, or whether it's just one meter or 10 feet or whatever, um, or whatever your interval is. So that's how you actually end up using the data in the real world. You're gonna summarize over what enter, whatever interval is being put into the model. Okay, thanks, thanks again, thank you. Dave. All right, with... <clears throat>